we know that COVID-19 has exposed, I say exposed fault lines, public health, health inequities, and mental health. Black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. We see the double jeopardy of that disproportionate impact when we think about mental health. That was Dr. Patrice Harris, psychiatrist and former president of the American Medical Association. On this episode of Moving Medicine, Drs. Harris, Moyes, and Otis share approaches to addressing health disparities in order to provide coordinated, culturally informed, and equitable behavioral health care. I'm your host, Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer. This episode of Moving Medicine is part of the Behavioral Health Integration Collaborative's Overcoming Obstacles series, helping physicians overcome obstacles that stand in the way of their patients' needs. Here's Dr. Harris. And what an honor and a privilege it is for me to participate. I will have to moderate my excitement uh, regarding the work of this collaborative and of course, AMA's convening of this collaborative because uh, integration of uh, mental health into overall health has been a personal passion of mine for over 20 years. I hope that all of you know about the AMA's uh, work. We are on our journey, making sure that health equity is embedded into the DNA of our work. And uh, we will be focused on that um, conversation uh, here today. And clearly, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, represents the uh, biggest uh, public health threat that we have faced in our lifetimes. Tragically, we have lost over a half a million lives. And I always like to pause a moment uh, because you know we often think about the statistics and the data as we should. Uh, behind each of those numbers though is a life and uh, families associated with those lives. And so I think it's important that we always just take a moment um, and realize that. So we also have millions of adults who are no longer working. We have our children out of school uh, and we have all of us who have been unable to hug and see and get together uh, with family and friends. And so the toll of this pandemic uh, continues to grow. But the data is clear here. Certain segments of our population have been suffering disproportionately because of COVID-19. And of course, a recent uh, SAMHSA brief talked about the double jeopardy of COVID-19 and the mental health inequities. Black, brown, and Native American communities, as you all likely know, uh, have been more likely to experience negative outcomes due to COVID. Uh, and by the way, as you all likely know, this is not new. Uh, we had been talking about health inequities regarding diabetes and hypertension and certain forms of cancer and, and mental health, of course. And uh, we know that COVID-19 has exposed, I say exposed fault lines, public health, health inequities and mental health. And so as folks uh, have been, black and brown communities have been uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID, uh, we see the double jeopardy of that disproportionate impact when we think about mental health. Um, I know we are all worried uh, that uh, and know that COVID-19 has worsened existing mental health challenges uh, because of isolation, as we chatted, increased stress, uh, inability to do some of the things that we all used to do to cope uh, with stress and certainly uh, having economic uh, recession and anxiety has created uh, for so many of us. and and. A phrase that sometimes uh, I use, and I did not uh, come up with this, but uh, I heard someone say, and I like this, that while we are all in the same storm, we are not in the same boat. And I uh, raised early on uh, that many of us had the privilege to work from home. And many of us today have the privilege of being in this virtual uh, presentation, uh, but not everyone, again, has those same uh, privileges. Uh, certainly as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I'm especially worried about the long-term impact this pandemic will have on our children, particularly children of color, but really all of us, children and adults, um, at, but again, may not have the access to resources. And again, this goes for everyone, 
but now though, I think is not the time uh, to panic, but now is the time to prepare. Uh, when you think about public health, we were not prepared. So as we think about uh, these, uh, the mental health impact and the longer term mental health impacts, we need to prepare. And that's what we're doing today. We're thinking about these inequities in hopes that we can better prepare. And I will tell you, of course, as a psychiatrist, and I hear this all the time, there are not enough psychiatrists and there won't be enough psychiatrists in our lifetimes, but that is the beauty of uh, this integration is we can work together uh, to increase access uh, to care. Certainly we have to think about uh, folks in the rural parts of our country uh, who are often underrepresented in discussions about health and wellness. And we've seen um, issues around even access to telehealth visits. Yes, we were able uh, to add telehealth as a part of our armamentarium to increase access. But again, not everyone had broadband access. Not everyone uh, had a data plan. And so uh, that just exacerbated in many areas uh, the lack of uh, access to psychiatrists, other physicians, or uh, mental health services simply because of where people live. A study late last summer by the CDC revealed racial and ethnic minorities uh, were top of the list in experiencing poor mental health, increased uh, substance use and substance use disorders and elevated uh, suicidal ideation. And we've seen that uh, particularly increase in our young uh, black uh, men. So as, as physicians, we cannot take lightly the stress and we don't take lightly the stress and uncertainty uh, that people have been feeling. And so we do have to uh, work together uh, to innovate and think of new ways to address behavioral and mental health as part of an overall plan to improve our patients' overall health, wellness, and well being. As I've often said, mental health is a critical component of our overall health. I, I said that during my inaugural address uh, when I was inaugurated as president of the AMA. And, and just as we uh, could seek help if we broke our arm or fractured our leg. Uh, we must certainly make sure that people see help seeking for mental health in the same manner they would see help seeking for a broken arm or other uh, chronic medical condition. But we, again, must acknowledge that there are systemic inequities that prevent marginalized and minoritized communities from seeking help in this area. I think there is a tendency to think about health and healthcare and whether you have access to a physician or hospital, critically important, uh, but certainly not the whole of what creates health. I think we know uh, that there are social determinants of health. And if we look even further upstream, we need to have conversations about uh, structural determinants of health. So yes, uh, whether or not you have a job, uh, your education, uh, your uh, job security, right? You can have a job, but still uh, not uh, make a wage that you have any uh, thought of having economic security. Whether or not you live in a food desert, whether or not you live in a health desert and have access to public transportation to get uh, to a, a store, grocery store, uh, where you could purchase fresh uh, fruits and, and vegetables. And of course, again, we have to think about and name and talk about structural racism and interpersonal uh, racism, sometimes uncomfortable conversations, but, but and I realize as a psychiatrist, and if there's a psychiatrist on the call, uh, we, we are probably more comfortable in having those un, uncomfortable conversations, but uh, we need to have those uh, conversations and they are difficult. And, uh, and certainly in the service of learning uh, and not blaming. Uh, uh, but again, uh, we need to learn about uh, redlining and past uh, issues around housing discrimination because, of course, that uh, leads to those social determinants of health. When we think about education, um, for, for the most part, how is education funded uh, through uh, taxes, right, through property taxes? And certainly, if you live in an area where your uh, property taxes are valued lower, that means that there's less uh, funding for our school systems. And so uh, these are all of the issues, of course, I think that we all know that contribute to health, but that gives us an opportunity 
uh, to think about problem solving. And I will say this, um, you know, as we think about individuals, yes, and we can think about choices and individual behaviors. Uh, but I always like to say the choices people make are based on the choices that they have. So we always have to uh, think about that context as well. So one uh, final schematic here, I belong uh, to a, a group, a steering committee here in Atlanta, and we are thinking about the need, uh, again, to look at our systems and meet people where they are. And I think that's a key tenant of the integration of behavioral health. I know my primary care colleagues on the line know that you are already seeing uh, patients who uh, have anxiety disorders, who have uh, a major depressive disorder. And so this is really about meeting people where they are and, uh, you know, not uh, and figuring out a way uh, for another solution. Uh, just uh, here's a number to Dr. Harris and, and call her and she may have an appointment available in, you know, two months or so. And so uh, I, to me, this is a, a key tenet of the work of this collaborative and your interest. It's really an interest in inverting the burden uh, away from the individual onto the system. We should be and are uh, by virtue of this collaborative thinking about this, of course, centering equity and understanding that equity means giving people what they need. I, many folks have seen that cartoon in the middle or the littlest kid needs two boxes to look over the fence. And so that's critical. So as we uh, continue to think about uh, mental health and, and a foundation of policy, I hope you know, and if you want to learn more about AMA policy, you can go on our website and policy finder, but we have a strong policy and, and, and of course now this work and the importance of fully integrating uh, mental health. So again, in today's uh, discussion, uh, we will go over how behavioral health can be incorporated in day-to-day -day primary care practice. And our speakers today, Dr. Moise and Dr. Otis, have extensive experience on the ground dealing with this topic. And we want you to leave with actionable items today and thoughts. And so I couldn't be more excited to get this conversation started. But first I want to give each of them a moment uh, to say a little bit about uh, our, our topic of the day. So uh, uh, Dr. Moyes, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview of health equity as it relates to behavioral health, um, particularly I think um, for me in terms of just the rising rates of depression and anxiety that we're already seeing just from a primary care perspective. Um, and so, you know, when you talked about the different layers of kind of the societal and the community and the individual level calls to action um, that you kind of laid forth, I started kind of brainstorming what can, and I think we're going to talk about this, what can clinicians start doing at those various levels today? Um, and, and one of my colleagues actually tried to break this down. If we think about racism from the structural, the individual, and the kind of internalized, what can we do at each of those levels? And, um, you know, we've Start, and I'm excited to kind of start talking about those, but in, rela in relation to kind of what you were talking about, I think the, for me, this, the, the key piece here is access to quality care. And it's the quality, to what extent are we providing high quality care to our patients? And I think that's something that we continue to kind of struggle with. You know, we're starting to move towards, you know, when we think about structural, what are we doing from a structural perspective? Yes, we can start screening for social determinants of health, but to what extent are we, um, creating those partnerships with the community so that we can send patients and address not just their mental health issues, but, you know, I've seen clinics starting to offer food and starting to think outside the box of how can we actually address these determinants um, real world now, you know, I've been part of a couple, are we, do we have a seat at the table in terms of policymakers, even if you're a person who doesn't think that you can do anything from a policy perspective, you can advocate for your patients, you know what your patients are going through. Um, and so we've actually started having webinars with just community members, anybody can call in with mental health issues and just talk as a group. Um, where it's kind of facilitated it from a community level of just and it can be therapeutic for members to talk about how you know, COVID has affected their lives for other, especially, um, you know, we've had a lot of patients of color who called in and just had a discussion with us. And mm -hmm. we were starting to really, I think the, the call is to start thinking outside the box. And I love the kind of various level that, levels that you talked about. Um, and then I'm a huge proponent of integrated care. Um, you know, I think there are very few models, anything outside of any disease state that you can think of. So models like collaborative care, there it's one of the few models that I can think of, um, integrated care, for example, that seem to improve outcomes more so in African Americans and minority patients than others, right? And so to what extent are we, you know, at least 
advocates of those types of programs in our own institutions. We know that you need to have a psychiatrist and a, and a primary care um, champion to make those work. To what extent are we champion programs like that? Um, so I think we've started, you know, our group has really started thinking about how do we, what else can we do? And I'll, we'll talk on this in terms of capacity building, of thinking outside the box to build capacity um, a little bit later. But, you know, we've, from a quality perspective, I think we've really started to think about what works, what, what does it mean to, to have high quality care? We've started training people and, you know, there've been a couple um, great um, publications about how to apply an anti-racist lens to mental health care, to really starting to think through how are we screening patients? How are we bringing up medications to them? Especially in a primary care setting where patients can't always separate the difference between their mental health and their physical symptoms. It's very hard to separate those two. You know, a, a migraine, it can be a migraine, but it's really depressive symptoms and, and vice versa. So we've really, I think, um, starting to really think about some of the, what can we do from a quality perspective? What can we do from an access perspective? And also just today, these are the kinds of things that you can kind of start doing now are these rapid QI um, initiatives that we've started, you know, to what extent are there inequities in your own system? That's somewhere that you can start now. Are there any differences? You know, we found that our African-American patients were more likely to get a phone visit than a video visit or an in-person visit. And there were clear differences in whether or not they got the usual quality metrics done. So they, they were much less likely to be screened for depression, despite the fact that they have higher rates of depression or more severe symptoms, right? And so really starting with QI and then doing rapid cycle interventions are things that clinics can start doing to address some of these um, inequities and um, really thinking from a structural perspective, thinking outside of your clinic, to what extent are we partnering with community settings? What do we you know, to what extent do, does does mental health have to be done in the primary care setting as well? We started screening and treating in churches in other community settings and we're really starting to think outside the box. And so I think when I think about a from a structural perspective, those are the kinds of things that I'm excited to kind of talk to you guys about. Um, and then at the discrimination perspective, the individual discrimination perspective that I think you also touched on, you know, we've started screening for it and asking about it and having an open discussion. Um, sometimes the types of mental health treatments available don't always touch on that, um, on the role of discrimination, the role of racism in how patients are experiencing their depressive symptoms. Um, and so those are other things that we can, we've started doing from a training perspective. Um, and then the last part of the piece is this kind of individual and self-worth. I still think there's still so much stigma. There's still so much, there are so many barriers outside. If we were, to, if we were able to fix the access issue, um, even in integrated settings, it can still be difficult. When I refer my patients, they don't always go to the mental health um, provider. So we started thinking outside the box of other ways that we can address stigma. Um, and maybe, and trying to make mental health treatment part of the fabric of what we do, that everybody gets mental health treatment, everybody gets a kind of wellness kit, no matter whether or not you screen positive or not for depression or anxiety, everybody, from just a preventative measure to what, it, I think that's the way that's the future of really making it part of completely the fabric, that we don't just screen you in or out for treatment, that everybody's getting some type of problem solving, um, treatment in the primary care setting. And so I think that's my hope for the future. And I'm excited to talk a little bit more about um, those pieces during this webinar. Very good, thank you. Dr. Otis, your thoughts. I look at this as a psychiatrist stepping back going, okay, now get into, get into your head and look at what your lens is. It's the first way in which I'm thinking about all of this. And my goodness, if COVID-19 didn't really set the groundwork for us to all do this. As you mentioned before, nothing is new, but everything's been highlighted, underscored, and bold, in red. It's all there for us now. And here now, as clinicians, I think we're even challenged by what our boundaries are now regarding all of this, uh, talking about the disease and talking about all the unintended things that have happened and the, the sequelae of anxiety, depression, all the mental and physical things that have happened because of this. So now look at your lens as, as, the, as the physician, as psychiatrist, as primary care physician, and what are you, what are you presenting? And, and what are your biases? Our unconscious biases at play. We're talking about social determinants of healthcare, 
Um, I'm listening to the discussion that has unfolded around COVID and who's been disproportionately affected. And then we're asking ourselves why, but go back to medical school, go back to where did you do your training? What hospitals did, were you in? What were the patients that you saw? What was the explanation given to you then for why these patients look like they do? Why are they seeking this care now? Why isn't there care like this other one? And then think about the different rotations you went on and where they were. Did you ask questions about these things? Did you notice one of these things is not like the other and try and find an explanation for it? This is still ongoing now. Right now with this and the whole vaccination issue right now, I'm, I'm watching the discussion unfold here and we're talking about black and brown hesitancy. And I, I hear that repeatedly, almost like a catchphrase, but I'm like, okay, stop. We've got to rewind the tape and go back and look at what happened before this in terms of relationships uh, with medicine for different communities and, and what, what has occurred. Not only what has occurred, what is still occurring and what is our bias around that. So I I'm um, encouraging everyone to explore that and look at that for themselves as we have this discussion in terms of thinking about what can you do now and what, what, what hasn't been done now and what those barriers are that we're going to discuss in, in, in some detail. I think all of these things are so uh, vitally important. And depending upon how you were trained, that's affecting your bias. I mean, as a child medicine psychiatrist who also trained in pediatrics, I got the benefit of working in consultation liaison liaison service. So I got to hear multiple opinions. I got, it was already ingrained that these different specialists are going to come about it as a different way. Uh, but then once we get away from that, and we're starting to do our own thing. We, we lose that perspective. So here's a chance for us to examine that today. So I'm, I'm ready to jump full in. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Otis. Dr. Moores, I'll start with you. So um, and I think there's two levels here. Um, but but why is it um, that integrated equitable behavioral health care, why is that so important in a primary care setting? Yeah, I think, you know, I touched on this a little bit. I still think that my, you know, the patients who make it to psychiatry, those are the people who are kind of ready for treatment or their symptoms are so severe that they had to go in. I think my panel remains a ton of patients, almost everybody who has either mild or moderate kind of depressive symptoms or anxiety that in which they still have this huge resistance. There's still this stigma, depending on the kind of setting that you're working in, where you know they're not quite ready, you know, they're not quite ready to leave the primary care setting a lot of the times. And I think that um, I guess there are two points here. One is that, again, I touched on this prior, they, a lot of patients can't see the difference between their, and this has been touched on in the literature a lot, between their depression and their anxiety, or their depression, anxiety, and their physical symptoms. And we know that, you know, there's a ton of research just in heart disease, for example. If you have heart disease and you have depression, you're more likely to have recurrent symptoms. Depression also just leads to heart disease. There's this kind of bi-directional approach. So they're so interwoven that I think it's just essential that we um, have both primary care and behavioral health patients are a little bit more willing to receive care if they think that it's, you know, a social worker or somebody who, um, looks like them or, or peer or somebody else within the primary care setting, I think it's done wonders to improving access to improving acceptability of treatment. And then I think we also know that this is, again, one of the few models shown to be effective um, in terms of at least patients' perceptions of discrimination, perceptions that access is a problem. Um, but I do think that we need to, some, one of the key pieces here is providing equitable um, and I think this is where things have started to decay a little bit, is making sure that the integrated model that you have is still high quality standard of care, that you're doing QI, that you're making sure that there are no discrepancies, racial discrepancies um, in the outcomes of your patients as you're kind of going forward. So I do think that this is essential just because patients want it. The symptoms are so interwoven that it's impossible to set them, separate them. And then I think from a communication perspective, when I send my patients out, I have no idea what's going on with them. If they are seeing a psychiatrist in a different um, part of the city, for example, I have no access to their records. I think this builds, it's a team-based approach. And I think that that's something that 
is rare and you don't really see that in lots of other specialties, for example. There's, this is one of the few examples of a team-based approach to improving mental health outcomes where everybody's kind of putting their heads together to improve a patient's outcome. So I think that's what some, these are some of the reasons why this kind of integrated equitable behavioral health um, care is so important um, to the primary care setting. Thank you. Dr. Otis, how can um, physicians build capacity within their integration efforts? And I, you know, I think we all know that there's no one right approach and there will be approach for a primary care uh, practice of one or two uh, versus uh, primary care practice in a large system, right? But, but and maybe you can uh, touch on, on both, your thoughts on both, but how can uh, physicians build capacity within their own uh, practices and within their own integrated efforts to ensure uh, something that Dr. Moyes uh, talked about, uh, equitable, culturally competent care and treatment. What are some key steps? So uh, they can take. Yeah, so in building that capacity, first you have to be curious that you don't think that you have all the answers already. And you have to investigate that with your patients. I know Pivotal, we've all been taught about the, uh, the patient-doctor relationship and how that therapeutic alliance is so fundamental in psychiatry. It's, there, it's also fundamental in your primary care interaction. So the building of that relationship requires a give and take. That requires a curiosity to ask questions of your patients and not assume the, the you know, or have a, a, a presupposition as to what you're going to get back. You're giving them uh, information, but you also have to be open, at, at open as to, you know, what, what might be interpreted as a resistance might really be a real reason that's preventing them from, from getting what, what it is you want. So I think you have to go, go in with that, not having the answers, having a, an open dialogue, willing to hear something that you hadn't planned to, and being able to pivot and, and think about, okay, how do I handle that and not take it personally? Because this is the foundation of a good relationship that's going to work out to be trust, where someone can uh, expose themselves, feel vulnerable to what they have to tell you so that you can get the, the outcome that's necessary, a good outcome for that, that person. And so while we're building this equitable best care practice and wanting to do that, that may look different for different, different sets of patients. I like your picture where one person needed two boxes, one didn't need one and, and one uh, and one needed one box in order to see that playing field. We're already doing that in our practices. We're just not thinking about it that way. That patient that's a, a talk that talks all the time, you're managing them differently than the person that says nothing. The person that's really quiet or that, that's very compliant, you're doing something different there already. So the paradigm is already there for you. So you just have to think about adapting it for what you need from a mental health perspective and having another, uh, another set of eyes, as it were, to confer with you so that you see something that you might be missing is now illuminated and you can discuss that with someone to really get the best outcome. And, and, and also I, one little piece that you were talking about stigma, stigma still exists. Some people are not gonna come to my office, but because they are already going to see their primary care physician for that lower back pain that, that chronically needs medication, they're not thinking about depression and it's not a placebo effect that you're giving them, um, you have to, to do some other types of treatment for that to go away. Thank you. And I will remind, I wanted to follow up on one thing you said there because I think it's so critical. Um, and I will remind everyone that if you have uh, questions, uh, please put those questions in the chat. And uh, Samantha just uh, put a note that uh, certainly uh, feedback is always welcome. Medicine doesn't stand still and neither do we. AMA members don't just keep up with medicine, they shape its future. Help move medicine, join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash moving medicine. Otis, you said something, and, and I have to say, and I'd also be curious as to what Dr. Moyes thinks about this. So as someone who's been passionate about this, you know, for a long time, sometimes, especially, and I'll just speak for myself, I'm so uh, passionate, and I talk to my primary care colleagues, and I really want you to do this. And one of my primary care colleagues on the board, I won't say uh, who he is, but he said to me, Patricia, you make it sound so easy, and it's not. So we're not definitely not trying to make it sound easy, but you made a key point that physicians are probably already doing a few of these things now, right, in their practice, 
maybe just not identifying it as an actionable strategy uh, for uh, behavioral health integration. So I think that that's a very important point. Uh, and speaking of that, so, you know, these challenges, because again, we, we it's not easy. And, uh, you know, primary care, especially primary care colleagues have so much to do, right, in so little time. Uh, so Dr. Boyce, what are some of the potential challenges specifically of addressing health inequities um, when we think about integration? And what are just some concrete, actionable strategies, practices can implement to help overcome those challenges? I think both of you, you know, there are so many, I think there's almost too much to, to even think about. When we think about the, let's not forget that in addition to patients who had these kind of um, inequitable outcomes, a lot of providers also were called in. We're seeing a ton of burnout now amongst primary care physicians, amongst clinicians, amongst everybody um, in this healthcare field. So I think that's a, these are newer barriers that are kind of emerging. And telemedicine, while it was supposed to be this kind of cure-all, it's introducing some additional challenges. For example, I had a patient, it took us 30 minutes just to get her on, tell, on, her, on the app. Um, and then by then you're, you know, so things have changed. And so, but we still have the same kind of 15 minute amount of time that, we, that we've always had to kind of address these issues. And, you know, so I think I'm, I'm gonna divide this by level. I think that at the primary care provider's perspective, there's still a ton of kind of um, challenges in terms of time and burnout and having to address just so many different. Now, before patients had one medical problem, now they are coming to you with 15 that are equally important um, and you don't have a ton of time to kind of address them. Um, and then I think, you know, at the system level, there's still, again, we always say there are not enough, um, there are not enough behavioral health providers, but I think some of that is because of triage. And I think the big piece is that what ends up happening is a patient who's completely inappropriate for a certain, if you, have a, if you think about an algorithm of one person goes to just a psychiatry if they're very severe versus a, a person who goes to kind of a care manager, for example, what's happening is, and I think this is creating the perception that there are not enough individuals. I do think there are not enough individuals, but I think there's such a bottleneck because we're just now randomly sending patients to anyone that which then kind of contributes to wait time and then you've wasted that patient's time, et cetera. So uh, there are multiple challenges just from the system's perspective. And then I think patients, I think telepsychiatry has made access easier, but it hasn't expanded the workforce. People think, oh, now we have telepsychiatry, everything's fixed. And I'm like, no, it's not like we created more doctors um, or more, right? So I do think that it's helped a little bit in terms of our no-show rates are better than they were before. There's great data that tele integrated care, telecollaborative care is better than practice-based collaborative care, right? A lot of it is because of better fidelity and better communication, but the, the outcomes are much better. So what can we do, I think, to address those different systems? From a capacity, I loved everything that you said, Dr. Otis. I think, you know, the primary care provider might be doing more than they think to address mental health, just listening to the patient, just talking to the patient is therapeutic. And um, we've started having residents and primary care providers go through therapy because it allows them to understand what therapy, it allows them to better understand, to kind of address, build a capacity even within themselves to just get started with some of the, the initial kind of at least mindfulness and other pieces so that um, they're better equipped to kind of acknowledge when a patient is really, when it's really time for them to kind of um, be seen by a psychiatrist, but it at least allows us to kind of get started um, right then and there. And we've also started resident run clinics where they can help titrate medications overseen by a psychiatrist that allows them to kind of build the capacity, build their, their comfort with treating mental health, but also allows us to kind of call out, you know, I had a resident tell me the same thing about the hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy amongst African-Americans. This is a teaching point. And I think we miss that over and over and over again. We're kind of like, yes, you're right. But there are so many opportunities for us to kind of address those inequities, address discrimination or, or assumptions that providers have. But it's, unfortunately, we're all going to have to speak up, everybody, right? Um, and then I think from, you know, we've, I told you, we've started like kind of thinking outside the box of creating kind of automated ways to better triage. But again, I, I couldn't be a more proponent of, you know, 
that the patient is the person who will tell you when they're ready and what they want, like really broadening their options of, hey, we could try, you know, really thinking through, I think that will help from a capacity building perspective as well of thinking, okay, here are all of your options. You can just do some psychoeducation and learn a little bit. You know, we can send you to a therapist, we can do medication, really, really meeting them where they are and really taking the time to kind of build the rapport that's needed to really um, get them into to mental health care, I think overall. So obviously there are a lot of barriers. Um, and I think the only other thing that we started doing as well um, more recently um, is the kind of, there are tons of toolkits and training modules of training um, our mental health workers to really start thinking about when you have a, a patient who is you know, African-American or who has dealt with discrimination, we might have to approach them differently in terms of even thinking about adapting our assessments um, building more awareness about racial issues like you guys um, talked about, using kind of more um, a humanistic approach to medications of really meeting people where they are, um, which might require really, you know, taking the time to listen to their experiences. And I think that's the biggest struggle um, as the primary care physician is the lack of time. Um, and I don't know if that's going to be readily addressed. It could be that we move to a system where we're having kind of snippets of, you know, the telepsychiatry and the telemedicine realm allows us to have more frequent visits. And maybe we're, we're kind of saying, hey, we'll, we'll start here today and then we're gonna build this. It might take us years um, potentially to get you into psychiatry, but I'm going to continue to kind of build that rapport and get you to kind of trust me so that we can eventually get you into treatment. And I think it's the time piece that it's the most challenging, I think, for us going forward. That, yes, go. I was going to ask you about the time piece. Yeah. The, the whole thing about time. So yeah. your the 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 amount of time that you have with the primary care physician is is awfully short. And then yeah. thinking about the time to collaborate, and even thinking about oh, am I going to get paid for this? Yes. So I think we have to think a little differently about the time. Some, sometimes in that that consultation that may happen outside of your office hours. Yeah. is going to save you so much time lamenting about what's going to happen with this patient, right? If you can have that, that, that consultation or even the fact that, okay, I'm going to send you for a consultation, an hour consultation, hour and a half with a psychiatrist that's then going to see something that's happening there and say, well, yeah, I'm going to prescribe this medication and send them back to you. And you, you're going to manage them until there's something arises. And so you've got the luxury of that, that, that hour and a half that wasn't of your time, that was someone else's, that then feeds you the information about that in a way that you were not going to have access to. So that's the, the beauty of doing that if you have the luxury of a consultation, but it's also nice to even have, talk outside of it where I, I get a sense of how you work, you get a sense of how I work. Here's another variable, have you considered this? Have you asked this? Yeah. And even if it's not you, if it's some, some other um, uh, professional that's within your office, that has a questionnaire to get to some things that you're not talking about. But even asking about the events of the day yeah. before you go in and say, why are you here, can also provide you with a lot of details in, in terms of that lead in. And we don't think about that. You're, you're not, our training makes us go like, mm, you got to get in there, got to find out why they're here, got to click it all off. But opening up dialogue really makes a difference. I completely agree. I think, and now we have more opportunity than we did before because we've broken the barrier of having to run into the psychiatrist. Now it's so easy in the electronic health record to say, um, I'm at this dose of this med, I'm not sure. And I think I think it's building the, I still don't know if we're, we're always quite there yet of um, the e-consultation where you haven't really seen the patient and the patient's not ready to see you and how comfortable are psychiatrists with that, with that place. Yeah. Um, and I think we're still kind of circling around, you know, but there are patients who just won't, you know, there's nothing I, you know, I've gotten them to start the antidepressant. Now I'm kind of like, I have no idea what to do next. And they're still so resistant. And I think that's the team-based approach that it, in a perfect world, both of us would be on the visit with them on an app. Hey, the psychiatrist here, I'm here. <laughs> we're gonna have a visit together as a team. That would be great. Technology is going to be, it, well, can be a solve, but as you said, could be, uh, it could, could raise more issues. But I remember, I think about 25 years ago, I did a sort of psychiatry 101 
session with the Georgia Academy of Family Physicians, and they I asked them what was their biggest complaint, uh, you know, that I could take back to my colleagues, and they said we don't hear from you after we refer our patients. So, you know, I guess perhaps there's an opportunity there. But a question from the audience for both of you, just to, um, if you had a magic wand and could create any technology, both of you, I think, mentioned apps, but I think we are going to see things that we don't even, aren't even thinking about uh, now. But if, if you had a magic wand and could create any technology uh, to help with what we're talking about today, what would it look like? What would you create? I'll give you a second to think about that. That's it, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and while you're, yeah, go ahead. We'll see, I, you know, not being a technological wizard, okay. um, I would take what is already in place and enhance it with communication because there's no shortcut to that. And, and we, we're, we've taken that for granted and that incorporates so much. So it's pointed communication, pointed questions, and, and again, be, be ready for that answer that isn't what you expected that allows you to go in and, and be comfortable in saying, well, I don't know, and, and let's get back to you, which, you know, we're the experts and we're supposed to have that at the ready and we don't necessarily have it. But that humanizes you, I, I think, at times, and that allows people to then expose themselves to you as well. So I go back to taking what we have and, and dusting it so much, dusting it off, enhancing it with better communication skills. Agreed. I, I'm literally building an app now. I got fun day too. And so I'm thinking about that question now for mental health in primary care. And I agree with you. I, we've tried to remove the human component. You can't. The patients need to be able. So I think we, we're now seeing it as a link. How can we figure out who absolutely needs the link? And how can this be used to screen? to triage, to help with the triage, to figure out where this person should go. And how can we use this to help the patient better communicate? We've added to it, how do I bring up mental health issues to my doctor? A lot of patients actually ask us like, we don't know how to broach this. I, my doctor, I think my doctor just wants to treat my, my heart disease. And I was like, no, no, we actually wanna. So, you know, trying to use this to better connect, to have better discussions with our patients, to activate our patients, to provide psychoeducation, to get the process started. You know, as we said, we have limited time. Something like this can be used to augment the primary care patient experience so that the doctor knows what the patient wants to focus on. Because sometimes we just were like, let's focus on this. We're going to talk about this. We don't even take the time to say, what do you want to focus on? And so getting some of that information, I think, um, and then we're starting to think of ways to bypass the primary when sometimes the primary care doctor is so busy. I've had patients tell me that the vice the 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 opposite. I don't want my doc if my doctor knows I have mental health issues, they might not take my chest pain seriously. Right? It's not like they don't want to deal with their mental health. And so we're finding ways to bypass the doctor straight to where you have the app, you go through your symptoms, we give you insight into what your symptoms are doing. We tell you about some psychoeducation. There are culturally tailored videos about other patients, their experiences, and then they can say, connect me straight to a care manager without necessarily having, especially if they don't wanna bring this up to their primary care, like meeting them where they are um, and using these tools to collect the data that can help us provide better care. And we're also trying to think about those tools that yeah, a perfect world would be automatic triage. This app is going to tell me, tell me if this patient needs psychiatry, care management, where should this person go? And I think a perfect app would be able to help us at least augment that process, but also help the patients connect their mental health and their physical symptoms. You know, we've been doing a lot of ecological momentary now, you know, assessments where patients can input, you know, today, actually, when I get good sleep, I feel less anxious like getting patients to connect those dots. We're starting to, there are people, patients are, you know, I think it's outside of our control now. Patients are using, there are tons of apps out there and I don't think we can ignore it anymore as primary care physicians. How can we incorporate that and um, bring that into the fold so that we can better understand what they're dealing with? You know, a lot of, I think the barriers that we don't, they think that we can't fully understand what's going on. And so some of these tools are, I think, starting to be very helpful for them to connect the dots between their physical, mental, some of their behaviors, everything else, so that we have a better kind of um, diagram of everything that they've been going through between visits, not just at the time of visits. We, we ignore all the other stuff people are going through outside of the primary care setting. And I think this might be a nice 
way to get snippets of that in a clear kind of um, way. But that's, yeah. some, go ahead. No, sorry, that's exactly important that. knowing where they're getting their information, Gener you know, besides the app. Okay, is it the parents? Is it the neighbor? Is it, you know, who is providing their sole source of information or what is the filter by which they're, they, they are um, giving you information? And sometimes we don't, we don't ask that. Again, I'm, I'm biased as a child psychiatrist. I have to ask the parents. I got to ask the teacher. I have to speak to the rabbi. I got to speak to the spouse to get a full picture, but as a primary care physician, you don't, you, you don't necessarily have that luxury and that, in, in, that, in that amount of time, but sometimes that's the homework that they have to bring into you where you're asking those sorts of questions of what these things mean to them, because it is a factor, because you're thinking, um, you're thinking very health, you're not thinking biopsychosocial method that we thought about with, in med school thing. You, 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 your, your direction is a little bit different. and, and you don't get all the answers that are necessary for you. Uh, I think, so all, all of that is important in terms of asking uh, the question and allowing that to unfold with the limited amount of time that you have. Yeah, and, and certainly we are all on our journey. Something that I've been thinking about, of course, in COVID-19 and folks have been thinking about being in their bubbles or in their pods. And I'm thinking, what if we could create these sort of integrated pods, you know, primary care, uh, uh, psychiatry pods, and, and, and figured that out. Again, just a, a wild idea that uh, came out uh, that was uh, certainly uh, stimulated by the pandemic. And, uh, you know, another issue I've been thinking about is teleteams because, you know, you both talked about the limited time that our primary care colleagues have. And so clearly, um, this is going to require a team. And I think uh, so often we think about teams within the office, within the system, within the clinic. And I think there's an opportunity again for teleteams, right? Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, that that's something we can think about. Um, so here's a good question. And we might have, this might be our last one. So if you could um, uh, both uh, answer this is, if I am a physician who wants to make my office more equitable, what are the concrete things that I can do tomorrow to begin taking steps or leaps in the right direction? Allow the different patients to provide you information about their culture, not just the culture in their home, but the culture that in their neighborhood community, the culture generationally from the grandparents in terms of what they get from that. Um, what is the culture of the school that they're in or their workplace? All of those things have import that we don't, that we uh, may take for granted. We are having this, we're thinking that people are having the same experience that we are having um, I, in the COVID, the uh, vaccination is a, a, a very strong indicator of, of this right now, of what people assume. And I will tell you that oftentimes you really don't understand or don't know unless you ask the question specifically and you're gonna get more than just the catchphrase and it's something else to integrate. So if I learned that from one patient, I now have some different information to take to this other patient. And the more I do that, I can, I can share those kinds of, of um, thoughts or things that I've learned, lesson learned for that day and pass it along as another thing that gets beyond just a catchphrase, gets beyond just cultural competence, but really gets down to knowledge that you've acquired from, from, from your inquiries. That's wonderful. Um, I really like the idea of almost listening and not being afraid to ask as well. So that to, you know, really understanding the full context, the full picture of what these patients are going through. I think primary care providers, especially, we're definitely guilty of just prescribing and not really paying attention to can they afford it or what, what, what are all the other things going on in terms of why they have heart failure or depression, et cetera. So I think a listening game and, and also starting to you know, do your homework in terms of your own biases and also some biases at the clinic level. Um, I'm a huge proponent of QI of just even looking to see if there are any discrepancies. If you look at the data, at your clinic level you can do that pretty easily these days of seeing if there are any discrepancies or um, differences in outcomes between patients and starting to practice and you know, do QI. We've done innovation tournaments where we just had a group of people come together in a room and come up with what are the most innovative things that we can do tomorrow to address equity. And then we've started having doctors have some hard decisions. Take a look at your panel. If your panel looks a certain way, um, or if you're, you know, maybe you're seeing patients who are only, who have mild symptoms and 
are very high functioning and they get to be go to therapy every single week, for example, for years and years and years, to what extent can we start creating some room for patients who are different, who are a little bit more acute? And I think these are the kinds of harder questions um, that we have to start doing, but we can easily just start looking at our own panels and trying to see, you know, to what extent I, that's something I can control, um, uh, you know, as how many patients who are, you know, particularly struggling or who don't have great access, how many of those patients am I actually um, taking care of um, from a, just an access perspective as well. And let me add just a, a couple of things on that. And these might even seem a little bit pedestrian in, uh, pedestrian in their recommendations. But I would, um, first of all, ask uh, maybe one of your uh, patients of color, um, does my office, even the physical plant, do you feel welcomed here? Uh, you might look at the magazines. Uh, I guess you know, they have magazines still. Uh, you might look at the magazines in the waiting area. You might look at the artwork. Uh, on the wall, um, uh, you know, lots of times there are informational posters. If you look at those posters around the wall, um, are they representative of a diverse set of patients? So that's just something, again, very simple. But the other issue I think, and we don't do enough, is just ask our patients. Even I, as an African-American woman who have a certain lived experience, don't pretend uh, to understand, uh, you know, what would make every person feel welcoming. And sometimes it's just asking, hey, um, you know, I value you as a, as a patient, you're coming into my office today. Um, are the environs welcoming? So some of those things, and, and then what could I do if not? And of course you have to be prepared and maybe the physician doesn't wanna ask that question or maybe have a, one of the, the front office staff ask that. Those are all the things certainly as a psychiatrist to think about boundaries to take into consideration. But I think the key point is asking the question. Uh, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you don't ask, you won't uh, uh, certainly learn the information. Well, I uh, cannot tell you how much it's been my pleasure uh, to participate uh, on uh, the panel or to moderate this panel with these two fantastic uh, speakers who have given me a wealth of information. I've learned so much. So uh, Dr. Moyes and Dr. Otis, thank you uh, so much on behalf of the American Medical Association, all of the members of the collaborative in contributing to our knowledge on behavioral health integration. So I thank you. You just heard from Drs. Harris, Moyes, and Otis on ways physicians can approach health disparities to provide culturally informed care. I'm Todd Unger, and this is Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. You can subscribe to Moving Medicine and other great AMA podcasts anywhere you listen to yours, or visit ama-assn.org podcast. Thank you for listening. <laughs>